much. Thanks. Yeah, so hi. My name is uh, Greg McNutt. I'm a technical director at Pure Storage. Been there a little over five years. And Gaurav? Uh, my name is Gaurav Jain. I've been with Pure for about seven years. I'm just an engineer, not a director. Like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, for those of you who don't know what Pure Storage is, uh, we sell uh, storage appliances. Some of them get quite large. And, uh, and this talk is really about what we do inside in our engineering group. So when we're working on improvements to this product, uh, we have this thing, I'm going to talk about this code factory, which is you know, shipping the code and verifying it. And so it, while we're doing that, we've got quite a large scale. And so this is really a talk about how we use uh, Spark and Databricks to, uh, to kind of make the system more efficient. So, so we have this problem. And, and, and it is anybody that's any con done construction of code and try to verify it and ship it out in many, many releases have a very similar problem. And that is that uh, while we're doing this, uh, we need to scan the results of these tests, whether they're test logs or actual platform logs, to understand uh, how the system is going and to look for, for problems. And so, so we have that, and we, uh, we, we have a lot of that. We have this need to uh, process these logs. Um, and so we built a system. And a lot of these early questions about this system were, OK, was this going to be a system that sort of live streams these logs and processes them as streaming, which is what we chose? Or is it going to be a batch system that at the end of a test, we will then extract all these logs and analyze them? Well, we, we chose the first for this particular thing I'm about to show you. Um, and then when you're looking at logs, there's really a couple things you can do. You can kind of run them into a search engine and then scan them that way. We actually have platforms that do that. Um, but at this particular scale, that became a bit cost prohibitive. And so we actually have a system that's just kind of a brute force scanner. And partly because you know, system and test logs, you kind of look at them once uh, most of the time. Uh, by these scanners, and then nobody really looks at them again. So the cost to index for essentially a single query like that was really didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and again, we have both systems, but this one at this scale is the one that seems to work pretty well for us, given the cost. Since we're building this platform and we have it, is there leverage? Is, uh, you know, once we've got a log, a log stream processor, can we use it for other things? And of course, that's what happens. These things grow like weeds, and we have quite a few systems that are processing the logs once we have them. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but in some cases, the logs are very ephemeral. Uh, we materialize a simulator, and it runs as if it's the product, and it emits logs, and when it's done, the logs are evaporated. So we do kind of collect them as part of, part of this process. And, and since this is a 24 by 7 operation, continuous, continuous testing, uh, we need something that's pretty much up all the time and, and grows with our scale. And so that's what we're going to talk here about a little bit here. So uh, again, I called it the code factory. Really, this is everything from a developer checking in source, actually many developers checking in source, and then verifying that code, which means constructing it, producing delivery packages, and then running them through lots of tests, a lot of tests. Uh, again, I mentioned our, our business is storage. This is uh, like in the particular business unit we're in, it's like NFS and S3 storage. And so one of the cardinal things about storage is you don't corrupt the data. You can be offline, that's bad, but corrupting the data is worse. And so we have an exorbitant amount of tests that we run uh, all the time. So you multiply the rate of change times the number of hardware configurations and platforms times the, the sort of scale and the release cadence, and you wind up with a lot. So Code Factory is the box of all of that stuff that our engineers use. And when it's all done, if something's been verified, there's an image that's, uh, that's published, and that's an image that would be used to upgrade one of these platforms uh, on the fly. So looking a little bit closer at what the code factory itself is, uh, yes, uh, we, we, we take, uh, somebody pushes code, it's a continuous integration system, and a construction system runs and builds this, and it's a pretty big code base, lots of different languages, lots of different technologies, critical, some are critical data paths, some are size critical, some are feature rich, and so we have the whole range of code that comprises this product that's atomically upgraded essentially onto the appliance. The output of that is artifacts, and some of those are the actual artifact that we would ship to the field, and some are intermediate artifacts, like here's some, here's some declarations or some supporting pieces on how a simulator should be configured or how a data generator would be uh, a set up, whether it's you know, Windows or this kind of Linux or that kind of Linux or versions. These artifacts are produced, and then based on the changes, a series of test plans are generated on the fly. And so a test plan is, oh, you changed this area, so yes, we've got you know, thousands of tests. Let's, let's pick the ones and emphasize the ones uh, that are related to that area and maybe sample a few others around there. And the idea is 
you know, that get the quickest time to a signal. If we broke anything, we want to know as quickly as possible. So we, we kind of pre-select the test plan, put it all together, and then dispatch it into a large system. The large system is based on Jenkins today. And, and then what happens is these jobs are dispatched to a large amount of test beds, and they're spread all over the world. And a test bed, I'm going to talk about what that is in a second here, but a test bed is a target, one of our appliances, whether it's real or virtual, and some data plans and some test plans around that. So all in all, it's about 100,000 jobs a day, every day. Um, we typically run some are long duration, some are short duration, and it, it doesn't really depend on sort of the release cadence and all. This is just a continuous rate of this thing flowing through. Let me dig into the test beds a little bit. So this is where the log files come from. So inside an abstract test bed, there's an orchestrator, which is kind of the Jenkins worker, and it, it sort of says, okay, this is the test we want to run. Let me set everything up. And so it sets up all these pieces and gets them hooked up and then sort of initiates the test and then collects some of the results. It has its own log files, and those are streamed out because a, a lot of the failures are something intentionally written by a test to say, here's the failure. Other ones are indirect. Something blew up, we know where it is, we gotta go look a little bit deeper. So uh, the actual stuff under test is two pieces. We call these initiators, the thing called data generators here, and those generate data to push into a storage unit and pull out and basically exercise it in different ways. And then the device is under test. Now, a flash blade, like what we work on, is actually a big multi-computer. It's a bunch, of, a bunch of computers and some chassis computers, and they're sometimes networked together into a large clump. So it's a lot of moving pieces. And each one of these pieces also generates a lot of logs, and they're all related to what's going on. So all, of, all in all through this thing, we have about 30,000 source components that are sending 100,000 log streams at any one time. So we have 100,000 log streams pouring into this thing. It's maybe five million lines a second, six million. It's actually growing right now as we're kind of expanding the platform. But whatever, it's just this big flood of data that's kind of flying through there. Um, today, like I said, five million lines a second, maybe a terabyte to two terabytes a day of continuous flow of, of these logs. So, so here's where they have to be used. Uh, so when you've got uh, hundreds of developers making changes, Sometimes these changes are incompatible or there's a mismerge of code or something like that. And so sometimes the code isn't caught early on in early unit tests, it's caught in these functional tests. And so we, we ship the uh, product out there, it starts running these tests, and some unexpected failure occurs. So that actually turns into a Jenkins job failure. Um, so at that point, uh, you know, with 100,000 jobs a day, we might have an error rate of a 1% or 2% throughout the system at any one time. That's a couple thousand jobs that are broken. And maybe they're one of those data corruption jobs, or maybe they're just a broken test bed, or maybe some transient common mode fault in the, in the engineering infrastructure. I, you know, they, it, it varies over time. So we have got a task for basically all of engineering to triage things we think are in their area. So if you're working on networking and you're working on storage and we see a failure in networking, your team gets to triage some of these failures a little bit. And this is a manual operation. This means dig through the logs and try and figure out approximately if it's in your area or some other area and, and figure out what's going on. Uh, but the key thing is oftentimes if I, if I push a defect and I break something, it's gonna show up very quickly throughout this ecosystem. And so these are repeated test failures, it's kind of obvious. So one of the things we do in root cause is say it's something already known, this department's already working on it, or that department is, or it's something new. Uh, but, but the key is that out of those 1,000 to 2,000 failures a day, a good 80 or 90% of them are repeats for things that we know about. Now, they might not 100% fail. Most of the ones that are interesting today are flaky tests that fail every fifth time or every fourth time. And so these are the ones that we know about, but we haven't yet pinpointed. So sometimes they linger in the platform for a little while or working on Anyway, so like I said, the repeated failures are a significant cost. And so this system that we call auto triage is the platform that goes in there and helps us with this problem. So, so uh, we, have a, we have a thing we call a signature, which is a particular failure, possibly for a particular kind of test bed or a particular test, or maybe just a blanket thing on a certain log file. Maybe it's one of those test logs from the top, or maybe it's an internal platform log from one of those components. Doesn't matter, they're all flowing through this system and all the test beds are kind of dumping, uh, dumping out their logs and then we scan them. So but the way that it works is the logs get sent into storage and then they get processed. And then if there's hits on these signatures and they make sense, then we can, and based on some deduplication, all, those signatures can automatically mark the job as it's been auto triaged, we know about it, we don't have to uh, you know, have somebody look at it manually. So that takes that load of 1,000 or 2,000 a day down to 100 or 200 a day. Which is, which is, at this point, tolerable to our engineering organization. 
Now, we made it a streaming system for a couple reasons. One is that we wanted signals in many cases as soon as possible. So if you've got you know, a particular test with a bunch of test beds, that, uh, t uh, subtests, I mean, that take eight hours to run, uh, that's eight hours, and, and we care. So if it's one of the early subtests fail, this, this platform may continue running all the rest of the tests, but we want to know on that first one. So we actually get a signal as soon as possible out of the platform. So that's part of the reason why we strongly lean to Tor as a streaming platform. And in this case, I say it's about 17 seconds from a stimulus to a signal out of the system. So, and, and we work on, we, we address those directly uh, as, we, as we go through. Uh, it's, I don't, it's a bit of an eye chart, but the, the page on the right is a, 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 a screen dump of JIRA, which we use for the defect tracking. And there really are those three fields at the bottom, signature, hit count, and hit links I want to talk about. So signature is the actual artifact that says what you're looking for. In this case, it says, look for the string failed to retrieve, retrieve container information via DNS. And it says, look in the Jenkins console log. And then it says, if it happens, report it to Jenkins. Say, yeah, we know about it. It's a known problem. Auto triage that job so that somebody's not going to look at it manually, and so on. Uh, this is a very simple, uh, simple signature. And below there, you can see it says there's been six jobs that have hit this. So that actually meant that probably when this thing was initiated, those six jobs would saved quite a bit of labor from somebody actually having to go in there and do that manually. Um, and then the bottom one is details about which jobs. And you can see they're kind of all over the place, different Jenkins, different platforms. So it's one of those, it's not a, it's not a problem pointing to a particular system. It's kind of widespread. So it's probably a software, a software bug. So you, you put lots of degrees of freedoms in these things. For us, it's the signature, whether it's a regex or whether it's text, whether it's you know, which logs to look at, on, and maybe only look on Jenkins in this side and don't care about the problem on that side. Developers, we have something like 1,000 signatures that are active at any one time, as all the developers are kind of watching for certain things to happen. And, so that, and, and we even have multi-line now, which is look for this line within three minutes of this line. And so that means that, okay, we knew that that first one set the stage, but the second one actually triggered it. So these, this is how it works. So system's flowing all these logs. For each log line, it matches to signature. If it hits, you know, then we mark it as, as being automatically triaged. And let me show you just a quick overview of a schematic of this thing, and then I'm gonna give it to Gaurav to go to a little bit more detail about what happens inside. So and it's got some numbers in here. So like I said, we've got five million lines a second of logs going into this thing, pretty constant. It's about a gigabyte a second. We, interestingly, what we do is we write it to the storage first, partly because it's our storage, but, but I think really what it is is that that's proven to be the most reliable part of this thing. Early on, we actually wrote all the log files traditionally through a log streaming system like Kafka, and then from there, archived them. But we actually were having some problems keeping the Kafka running reliably over time. And so what happens when it blows up, then we lost the, the log files. It's better now. We probably don't have to do this. But in this case, we've, we archive first. So that's why it's kind of an ELT kind of a pipeline is what we, what we say. All of those log files flowing from all those sources turn into about 20,000 20, batches a second. And a, and a batch of metadata is sent actually through Kafka. And that says, you know, okay, you wrote the log. Here's a chunk of a log file. Go process it. So the system busted up into log pieces. And the reason we do that is... Any of you that have worked on cases where there's a large variance in the size of a data set you want to process, you know, you have some log files that are five gigabytes and some that are 50K. Uh, you don't want a single one stuck in a thread, you know, just task executing. So we bust them into pieces, so the pieces are essentially shuffled out. And they actually can be shuffled out out of order, which if you think about it, that's interesting on how, how we handle multi-line. So we actually have a whole system at the back end that handles multi-line when the arrival order of pieces of the files comes out of order, which is what we, what we do here. So we don't, we don't have any ordering requirements on the, on the platform. The other thing is, is that if we, if we lose this whole Spark pipeline and we do an upgrade and we screw something up, the data has already been archived first. So that gives us the ability to kind of recover the system and, and pick up where we left off, essentially. So we have about uh, six or 700 cores that are continuously processing all these log files. Like I said, about 1,000 active signatures at any one time. Those come out of JIRA, they're buffered, and those two are mixed together. And that re results in about actually 50 raw hits per second. So those are actually 50 hits throughout these signatures on, on average. They'll go into this thing that's called an aggregator here, which does some deduplication and the temporal analysis for multi-line uh, um, uh, signatures. And it has about 1,500 updates a day. So that's about what we're looking at on, on average. And those are the updates to say to Jenkins, yep, that failed job, we got it. It's a known issue. And mark the JIRA, by the way, you've already got 4,000 hits against that thing, you might wanna fix it. You know, so this is kind of what the engineering dynamic looks like. 
So that's the top level schematic of the pieces that are, that are running inside here. So I'm gonna hand this over to Gaurav and you can go into a little bit more deal on, detail on these pieces. Thanks, Gaurav. Thank you, Greg. Uh, am I audible? Okay. So uh, now that we are done with the archi architect level stuff, let's get to some engineering. Um, other way. Oh yeah, other way. Okay, so uh, this, this architecture diagram has this big, sp uh, big piece, right, Spark. It's actually not that big for us. Our aim with Spark was make it small and easy, make it repeatable, and just add scale. Um, so we don't you know, fail that much. By doing that, we add robustness. Uh, so what our streamer Spark code, this inner loop, basically what it does is it reads from Kafka. Kafka has a stream of messages that we, uh, the, the log files, the log lines themselves, the chunk of the log that uh, it ingests. It gets a batch from Kafka, loops over that batch for every message. It reads the, well, it reads the Jira signatures, um, not every time, uh, the first time itself. Uh, reads the Jira signature, processes the, reads the log lines from the uh, flash blade itself, because our flash blade is uh, super fast. Um, and once it finds a match, it posts again to uh, another Kafka, which is the aggregator, which the aggregator reads from that here, and rinse and repeat. Uh, our Jira signatures are special. They can be single line. Hey, you find this log line, you match the line, you, uh, that's a hit, that's a fingerprint. Uh, it could be multi-line. Hey, if you, have a, if you find this line within the next one hour, you find some other line, that's a signature, that's a hit. So it just squashes all of them down, finds every single log line that we are interested in, and reports it as a hit, and it's the aggregator's job to take care of the rest. Uh, so that's basically our Spark code uh, in a loop. So what does it look like? How does, how does this system behave? So this is basically a small example of a defect timeline. A developer pushes in, uh, some new code. It causes the test to fail. Uh, we start seeing a whole bunch of reds. The test was green before that. We start seeing a whole bunch of reds. Uh, we, someone reports it. The developer fixes it. They add a signature for it. The system sees the signature. Now, the test still continue failing, but our auto triad says, yes, we know about this test. It has failed. Mark it with this particular JIRA. Once this JIRA gets fixed, the uh, fix is released, and the test starts passing again. Uh, the important thing to realize is we don't have to spend a whole bunch of engineer triage hours on this thing because our auto triad system takes care of this. Um, so what's, what's missing here? Uh, all of this looks good. What's missing here? Uh, what's missing here is those reds, which were uh, the fails that happened before the signature was added. What do we do about those? Those would still show up as a failure in our defect tracking system. So, uh, hey, we already have a system to look at the logs. Let's, let's repurpose it. We can look at the logs. Uh, we, we can look at the logs. We know which jobs failed. We can reach out to Jenkins. We can reach out to the Flash Blade. Let's let's rescan them, uh, and we kind of know which jobs failed. So just run run it again. So you recall how uh, this is just a recall slide to just, uh, for the for the architecture of this entire thing. Uh, we repurpose this for some look back. Uh, that's what we call auto look back, which basically looks something like this. Let's see, just once again. So it's fundamentally the same thing, but what we do is just get the get the jobs that failed, get the logs for that job, put it through the exact same system. Uh, it's a different set of Spark cluster. Uh, it's not as beefy because we really don't need that much, uh, that much power for this. So, and uh, what triggers this look back is whenever a new signature gets added, a look back is triggered because now we have something else to look for. So let's just do that. So it reads from Jira, reads that signature. It doesn't need to process a whole bunch of signatures, not a whole bunch of uh, matching. Goes through the flash blade, runs it across the failed jobs, gets the logs, uh, generates the hits, posts it to Jenkins. Uh, we have come up with, heuristically, I guess, it's just a magic number, we have come up with 25 hours to look back in the past. Anything before that, well, no one really cares. Uh, so uh, if you recall, this was our Spark code inner loop for uh, the primary system, which, and we extend that for our uh, lookback system. 
So uh, it's basically the same thing. You read a, a new Jira signature, triggers the look back, we read the failure from Jenkins, and put it through the exact same loop again, which generates the hits, and which allows us to uh, capture those defects. Now, one interesting use case of this, what we found that Spark allows us to do, is coalescing. When a lookback is triggered, uh, let's say a lookback is running. It takes some time to run, say about 20 minutes or something. Uh, we, uh, we are running it for the 25 hours. Let's say between that time, we see more signatures come in. Hey, it was a bad day, we find more bugs, just uh, people start adding more signatures. What happens then? Hey, we have a queue, a lookback is already running, we queue the other lookbacks, but while doing so, we can be smart about it. We can just look at the uh, queued lookbacks and just squash them together. The window, the 25 hours that we look behind, we just extend that by. Uh, by the time it took for the new signature to come up. So we, you can extend that to 26 hours, 27 hours, and uh, instead of processing every single new signature again, you can process two signatures at that same time. You can process three signatures at the same time. And this allows for a lot of savings. One signature takes about 20 minutes to run. Two signatures with that, with some expanded window, would take about 23 minutes to run. Uh, so instead of 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, we can just do everything at once in 20 minutes, or 23 minutes. So uh, that's a very interesting use case we found when we, uh, when we were looking at the system. So uh, what, are the, what are the results? Uh, our auto triage has actually proven that it's very, very easy to deploy something like this using Spark, uh, and it saves a lot of engineering hours. It, it's, it's ridiculous, like the amount of time now people have to spend looking through the triage logs, that's much less. It used to be, hey, we need about two people per team on triage every single time. Uh, but now it's fine, one or two people, three people across the org, you can just keep on adding signatures and auto triage will take care of the rest of it. And we still have good tracking of, hey, this failed. Oh yeah, there's a link, there's that, that's the bug. We know that it's, uh, it's being tracked, it's being worked upon. Um, Writing first to Flashblade and then to Kafka gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, how so? We can issue lookbacks. We can automatically issue lookbacks. It allows us to brute force general lookback. What we mean by that is, uh, let's say there was some bug in the system for some time the pipeline was down. What do you do? Well, auto, auto lookback is not going to find it because there's no Jira signature, but you can issue a manual look back, say, you already have the logs, you already have uh, all of the failures, put it through the system again. Uh, just give it the time duration that you know the system was down for, and just let it run. Um, so we can just go through a general look back, brute force look back. Uh, our log store is available for manual search and scan. Um, what that allows us to do is, Let's say we figure out there's an issue uh, in the field, and we want to know, hey, how did we miss it? How can we make sure we don't miss it in the future? So we have all the logs. Uh, we can, because they are persisted on the flash blade, just look through them. This has happened once for us at Pure, because we write good code, you know. <laughs> but uh, this has happened once. Uh, we found an issue, we had to look through a year long of, uh, year's worth of logs in the past and see the pattern, figure out how we missed it and how to make sure that we don't miss it ever again. And finally, what this allows us to do is if we ever need uh, another ELT pipeline, well, we already have that, we, we can already stream this, let's just add more consumers. Um, let's say for some reason we now decide that, hey, instead of just looking at all of the logs once, we want to index them, or we want to index specific logs, we can add more consumers and uh, do it that way. So uh, this was a huge experience that we went through and we deployed uh, in our own production, and it has been working fantastically well. So those were just some conclusions that we reached. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically all we had for you. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Yeah. For any questions, I have the mic. Uh, please raise your hand and I will give you the microphone.
It's all good. I think we're in the way of lunch. So up, up. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, awesome. Uh, do we, first the question is: Do you see uh, that you need to ac run across uh, multiple logs for getting the, the the one problem? And if that's the case, how do you trace uh, your, your your the problem across multiple log files? Right. That's one. Uh, second, uh, because there, because if it's in the distributed environment, uh, you know there could be logical. Uh, there's a logical time, but the physical time could be drifted, right? So that's first. Uh, my second question is, uh, 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 sorry, I forgot my second question. But. Well, that's okay, maybe. So on the first one about uh, looking for patterns across log files, so we don't do that today. Um, we actually probably don't need it much, but that multi-line signature matcher would work the same way. So what happens is all of the signature hits go into that aggregator, and so you could describe the signature as saying one of these followed by one of these temporally. And so since we have timestamps for all the log files, we could use it that way. We just did, it's one of our backlog items. We just haven't done that. Uh, the multi-line signature is basically, right now it says for this log file, you see this log line, and within the next 24 hours, 60 minutes, whatever, you see this other log line, that's a hit. Now all we need to do here is add another metadata saying that, hey, for this log line, if you see this, yeah. and then after this, if you see this other log line in this, uh, for this other file, this, that's a hit. That's a easy enough uh, addition to it, but we haven't really needed it. Okay, cool, thank you. Oh, I remember my second question. So uh, as, a, as an engineer, I look at my team's build every time, right? Whenever there's a failure, I got notification, I needed to jump into that, right? Uh, why there is a need of a centralized triage team to do that for us? Is that a, because engineer teams are not doing their due diligence? What's the reason behind this work? It's, it's probably not that uh, negative. There's a reality at large scale. Uh, we, we ship one product. And yes, it's got a storage component and a networking and a chassis management and you know, like a, you know, a dozen components inside there. Um, but, but oftentimes where the ambiguity comes in is it's not clear who owns that particular failure. So somebody's failure over there might manifest in your side. So we generally say all teams, in our case anyway, uh, all teams have somebody assigned for triage and the failures in that particular test are gonna go to your team first and you might have to redispatch it. As far as auto triage being a generic tool for that, well, it's generic like Jira or these other tools we have are kind of one like that. But, but you're right, though, that one of the challenges in any engineering environment is who owns the fault, who has to do the troubleshooting. So, but we, we treat it as sort of one tool like that. And uh, just to add a little bit to that, a lot of times there are some failures which are not under our control, right? Like we are a hardware company, we build a hardware product. There are some, sometimes we have dependencies on some vendors. Let's say they have a, a bug, we know about that, but we cannot do anything about that. Right? So sometimes that can happen. Sometimes test is being run on this massively distributed uh, infrastructure. There can be infra issues. There can be power loss at a data center or network is down or something like that. We can catch all of those issues as well. Good question, thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah, it's all good. All right, I appreciate, Hi. oh, go ahead. I got one. Hi. Um, so how many machines are creating logs that you're collecting, and how do you, you know, collect all the logs? You know, if there's thousands of machines producing these logs, how are you collecting these logs? And, and yeah, so, uh, and they're all different. So good question on what are the logs, right? So there's, I don't know, maybe six or 7,000 hypervisors and combinations of VMs and all that that are running. Some range and like that. And that I mentioned earlier about 100,000 log streams that are coming out of this thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot of data, and, but it's, uh, the way that we use the flash plate, it's NFS, so they all mount it, and they just sort of write the data in there. So it's a large, large NFS platform that they're writing to. Um, the, the data that went into that little Kafka batch is a little bit more like metadata. It says, hey, here's a chunk of log file. Here's the log file in that NFS, and it's the metadata. Here's the metadata for that chunk of log file. It says this job on this system and all that. So, so it is really a brute force system. We have got gazillions of sources coming in. We have multiple, by the way, multiple regions of this running. Uh, so it's just gazillions of brute force rolling into the storage engine. 
And we, we have seen failures with Spark, Kafka. Flashblade has been the most stable yeah. thing. That we've blown our, we've, we've blown up the Flashblade too at scale. So it's, yeah. we've learned, we've used it as a, for us it's a little bit of a dog fooding thing. So we use it at, at scale like that. But we've, we've hopefully helped at the high end in terms of the capacity. Hey, this dog fooding has found its customers. It's found, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> awesome. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks yeah. again. Bye Thank now. you so much.